Welcome to Unibet's Inside the Octagon. I'm John Gooden and with me, as always, is Dan the Outlaw Hardy. Massive card, massive arena, one show just isn't enough to do justice to the analysis. So, this is the first of two Inside the Octagon shows and today we'll be breaking down two key fights. The co-main events between undefeated strawweight champion Joanna Jungjacek and Valerie Latourno and... As the Octagon prepares to rumble, we will look at the rematch between Mark Hunt and Bigfoot Silver. November 14th, the world's most dominant athlete makes history once again as UFC women's bantamweight champion Ronda Rousey takes on undefeated former boxing world champion Holly Holm in front of a record-setting stadium crowd of 70,000. Plus, undefeated strawweight champ Joanna Young Jacek looks to defend her belt against Valerie Letourneau. UFC 193, where will you be? So two belts up for the taking at UFC 193 and the co-main, Joanna Jungjacek, who possesses the Polish power against Valerie Letourneau. And let's take a look at the facts and the stats, Dan. Both of these individuals have awesome striking. The champion there with, you know, the second highest significant strike differential in UFC Championship history, that's, that's pretty good, I guess. The thing that stands out to me is that they've both got takedown defense in the 80% in the margin, which shows that they both like to strike. So that makes me excited immediately. <laughs> makes me excited too. So two strikers going head to head. And let's get straight into the analysis of this one then, Dan. So Joanna Zunjajek hasn't really looked too tested thus far, no. but she's coming up against someone who does have very legitimate Muay Thai skills. Whether they're as good as Joanna Jungjacek, we are about to find out, I yeah. guess. Yeah, it's a different kind of skill set. You know, she's she's much more of a boxer than a Muay Thai fighter. She's also got the American top team guys behind her, and yeah. I, I can't doubt anyone that comes out of that gym because they've been producing people at a high level for a long time. Sure. Now they've got a, a championship belt in there, they'll be looking at getting their hands on another one as well. Okay. Um, there are some things I like about Valerie Letourneau's fighting style. I, I, I like that she's confident in the weapons that she's got. She, she really likes her right hand and she really likes her lead kick. You're going to see her using this a lot. And this was her last fight against Marina Moroz. A lot of people counted her out of this fight because Moroz kind of came into the UFC on a bit of a whirlwind, you know, yeah. submitting Jojo Calderwood and stuff. But look at that beautiful knockdown in the first round. And if you watch it, she sets it up with the body kick there. And then she's going to reach forward with her lead hand and then fire that right hand straight behind it. Beautiful right hand, right on the chin. It's a really nice change of awesome. weight distribution and to get the power. Exactly that. And it's going from that left kick to that right hand. There's a natural yeah. rocking motion. It, yeah. it's, it's a, they're, they're perfectly coupled together. And you'll see her as the fight develops, she starts to use it more and more. The body kick, it's got a real good slap to it. She throws the double right hand a couple of times, but it's that, again, that body kick. And she's quite comfortable standing in range. You'll see this from her first fight with Elizabeth Phillips when she was actually at bantamweight, 20 pounds heavier. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, she had a, a troubling first round. She, she damaged the cheekbone, which slowed her down a little bit. But as soon as the second round came on, she, you could see her hand speed. You know, she was so much quicker than, than Phillips. Um, and then she took that into her second fight with Rokosi. She was just, you know, her hands were so much quicker. She'll stand right in the pocket and, and block and trade. And we don't see that a lot in, in uh, uh, Joanna's fights because a lot of the time people get backed up and they're sure. constantly trying to shoot to take her down. Whereas now we're going to have someone that's going to stand in front of her. With their chin tucked as well. With their chin well. tucked and their hands up. <laughs> Very important. <laughs> yeah, always. Against the Ch Joanna Champion. Uh, she's looked awesome, she though. Has. I mean, it's, it's difficult to put a case against her when it comes to the striking game. Obviously, there are many elements to this. And having a backing like American Top Team is very strong for Letourneau indeed. Yeah. But I'm interested to see what Joanna can improve on and bring in this not a grappler striker situation yeah. it's a striker striker matchup yeah. and that presents all kind of fireworks it does it you know it changes things entirely because she's been focused so much on defending the takedown in every yeah. one of her fights um you know i mean if you watch a fight with against like claudia gadalia for example you know she was constantly trying to defend the takedown she got some good striking exchanges in but it was ultimately about staying on her feet um, in her last fight against Jessica Penne, she showed some developments in her game, which I want to talk about in a second. But normally we see her pushing forward and picking her opponent apart, which we saw in that fight. But we also saw her counter striking. Now, uh, if, if we look at her, her first fight with, with Juliana Lima, this is what's typical of Joanna. She'll push her opponent back against the fence. She'll stay just out of range. And then she'll use her speed and her technical ability to pick them apart. Whereas this, this is her moving backwards. Jessica Penne's just reset. She's been hit with the left hook. She's going to push forward again. 
and then there's another left hook on the way in. So th this is another element that, that, that we're seeing of, of Joanna's game that we've not seen before because no one's been that aggressive with her again. Jessica pushes forward into the clinch, she gets hit with a clean elbow, and then it's immediately back to Joanna's game. She's here, she's picking her off against the fence. So now look, now she's scanning her look. She's using, she's got all of these tools, she's scanning her opponent, she's seeing where she can strike. And what you're gonna see is a nice measured attack. She'll pick, she'll use that nice long range, and then she throws this flurry of strikes. Now this is something, I'll be honest, I don't particularly like it, I don't like to watch it, but I understand the point of it. She'll flurry her opponents to kind of overwhelm them, to get them to close their eyes and put their hands up, and then she'll pick the solid shots that do the damage. So what you're saying is she should essentially be in the X-Men series. Exactly, we should do it here again, look, she'll flurry, but then there'll be one shot which lands. In fact, history trip for you, if you go back to Chuck Liddell versus uh, Tito Ortiz, Okay. Chuck Liddell backed Tito up to the fence and, and Tito was doing his traditional, you know, the crazy monkey defence that he used to do. <laughs> and Tito and Chuck, Chuck were doing what he normally does, wailing away, and then he snuck a straight hand right down the centre. And because there was all the confusion with the flurry of yep. strikes, it created that window and Joanne is very good at doing that. So expect to see, see that if she can get her opponent backed up to the fence where, you know, Valerie's probably not going to take too many steps backwards in this one though. Okay. Well, I'm not good enough to always give you the questions, Dan, so I've asked the world of Twitter. <laughs> let's take a look and see what we have. A few. Quite a few here now. So yeah. let's go with this one here from Matt. Thank you, Matt. Uh, does it surprise you that Valerie is the biggest underdog on the card, given that Rousey's fighting? <laughs> That's an interesting it's twist. A, it's a good question. It's a good question. You know, um, it, it doesn't surprise me. And the, the basic fact is that, you know, Ronda's fighting Holly Holm. That's, that's the bottom line of this. I, I mean, it doesn't surprise me that Valerie is the underdog because, you know, she's had three fights in the UFC. She's only had two at straw weight, and she's looked great, but she's relatively unheard of, whereas Holly Holm's got a big boxing yeah. following. She's two got... Two-time rings. Exactly. Uh, you know, covered. a lot of people know Holly Holm <clears throat> before she even signed with the UFC. So she's got that kind of star power that she's taking in, which is probably, you know, making her a bit more of a favourite in the fight. But, you know, don't count Valerie Letourneau out. American top team are a, a fantastic gym, and she... I don't know why she made the move. This is an interesting thing we were talking about the other day. I'm not sure why she would move from Canada to go all the way to America. Yeah, she's from team, Montreal. But yeah, but there's obviously something there that's working for her. And having trained there, you know, I, I can only say good things about it. So don't count her out. She's a dangerous girl. And she's been around a long time. I think she was the first female mixed martial artist from that area as well. So she, she's been amongst us a, a little while. A lot of pioneers on this card. A lot of pioneers, <laughs> a lot of pride as well. Yeah. This intriguing matchup has so much to offer fight fans, so make sure you get involved. What will be the outcome? Will the fight finish early or will it go into the hands of the judges? As ever, there are odds to be found on every round at Unibet. Watch and bet live with Unibet, the official betting partner of the UFC. So, Dan, late 2013, one of the fights of the year, if not the fight of the year, yeah. Hunt versus Silva. It was an all-time classic. Let's get into it, take a quick look at the facts and the stats. Well, physically, they are very different. Are. But I think what's showing us here, as was a result of the first fight, there's, <laughs> there's not a lot between them. Perhaps Mark Hunt is slightly busier. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's really it. All you can take from the stats, you know, Mark Hunt throws at a slightly higher rate, but. But, you know, just look at the stature of the two guys. 72 inch reaches versus 80 inches. I mean, I'm not saying that Mark Hunt is not used to fighting people of unusual sizes. I mean, he fought Stefan Struve, for example, yeah. but that, that is an immediate challenge that I see on the page. But having said that, you know, the first fight, it was so evenly matched. You know, it's probably going to take someone as, as big and as, as scary looking as, as Bigfoot to, <laughs> to, to, to compete with Mark Hunt. I mean, he hits like a truck for a start. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> let's, let's take a look at that first yeah. fight then, Dan, because yeah. it's... Sometimes I think about my life now as an analyst with the UFC and you get paid for watching these fights. It's a dream come true. It is. And let's, uh, let's have a look at that rerun <laughs> of or, or certainly some of the standout moments of the first fights. Yeah, well, this, you know, it, it was an interesting story, this one. It started off, um, it, it started off very much in Bigfoot's favour. He was doing the right things. He was quite patient. He was maintaining distance well. He was on his toes quite a lot. And then he started chopping away at these low kicks. You can see that one buckled Mark Hunt's leg. And that one hurt him, visibly yeah, hurt him bad. early on in the fight. So was that round number two as I well? I think it was, yeah. yeah. So Bigfoot started to do the right things, but then all of a sudden there was that sneaky right hand straight through the centre. And unusually for Mark Hunt, he threw it straight, like we were talking about a little earlier, uh, with the Chuck Liddell Tito knockout. 
but then you know it just descends into chaos <laughs> and this is what we expected to see beautiful chaos beautiful absolutely i mean this is this is two guys giving everything they've got for their own pride and for their fans and just for the love of this sport and I mean, they're just, you know, Mark Hunt is, is known for this. He wants to stand and trade in the pocket because he knows the odds are good if he's testing his chin and his punching power against okay. these guys. Whereas for me, Bigfoot kind of got drawn into the fight a little bit when he didn't really need to. After that knockdown, he seemed to kind of throw his game plan out the window. And this is what we get. We get this, this, this back and forth trading. One person's landing clean shots. The other one's rocked and hurt. Then, then it switches and Bigfoot's coming back. But Mark Hunt always, like we were saying, he's got a slightly higher work rate. In, for my money, he landed the better shots. His eyes are more finely tuned for picking those shots. He's got better head movement. So Bigfoot the needs to... He's a K1 fighter as well. Exactly. So it's a more natural I mean, It's so much experience to take, into, take into the octagon. Whereas, you know, with Bigfoot, he needs to be a bit more disciplined and stick with, the, with you know, his method of fighting in the first two rounds because he was winning. He was picking him apart. The low kicks were having, were having some success. So... Just don't get drawn to the fight too much because you don't want to fight Mark Hunt. <laughs> yeah, but then Mark Hunt went and uh, scored a takedown or yeah. a couple of takedowns, so yeah, he, he can mix things up. He did, yeah. That was a surprise. So let's take a closer look at Mark Hunt then for this fight. And, I mean, that camp are going to be taking a look back at the rerun of the first one. Yeah. Uh, what are they going to make of that? Well, I think they're going to see the same things. I think they're going to see, you know, when Mark Hunt closes the distance and when he does start to make it a bit a bit of a crazy brawl, that's when he starts to benefit. I mean, he had good counter-punching against Czech Congo. Here, look at this beautiful left hook there. Put Congo down for a second. But, he's, you know, he's so patient. He's so economical because, you know, he is a big guy and he punches hard. So when he throws, he throws with everything he's got. But he's at such a disadvantage yeah. with the range. I know he is, but he's got the X factor. He's got that, that unbelievable punching power. Look at this, backing up Stefan Struve. Struve being seven foot tall, having an 84 inch reach. It doesn't you know, even look like a fair matchup. It doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. But this is, you know, this is the X factor that Mark Hunt's got. He's got that punching power that is just the leveller. And, and the one person that's been able to wear them better than anybody else has been Bigfoot. Yeah. You know, if you look down both of these guys' records, they're stopping people first round. And this one was an interesting one. It showed. Look at that beautiful head movement. There's good. There's good movement. There's good knowledge in Mark's movement. He's, he's a very educated striker. I mean, he doesn't necessarily look like like a, you know the consummate athlete that he is, but he's got all the mechanics. He moves really well. He reads an opponent well. He can see these windows of opportunity where he can catch them when they're lowering their head or they're leaning back like Stefan Struve. And he'll take those extra half steps or he'll create that extra little bit of space for him to land that uppercut because he's been those in these situations before and he knows how to, how to manipulate the situation to land the shots that he needs to. He's actually made a few changes as well, I think, to his diet. I think he's gone plant-based. Right. And he's, he's slimmed down a bit. He looks, he looks slightly different. So, yeah. you know, we can see how that affects him, maybe mobility. Over 25 minutes, he needed it against uh, Bigfoot, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, talk of Bigfoot then. Yeah. Uh, again, there's a lot to take from that fight. He said he had a back injury in his post-fight interview, so maybe he can offer some more, which is quite exciting to think that there was more to give in that fight out of yeah. either of these two athletes. I'm sure both of these fighters are going into this rematch with the mentality that it's not going to turn out like the last one. They're both going to expect it to be a quicker finish because they've solved the issues that they had in the last fight that didn't get the finish and they're going to take that knowledge into and this next one. And that one was one. over 25 minutes. It was. It was. I mean, it was an absolute war. And this one, yeah, this one's a 15-minute sure. one. So there's, you know, there's less time to punch and more, more, uh, more work to do. So if we look at Bigfoot again, you know, He's, he's just got devastating power, but he's much more clinical in his approach to it. You know, he's, he's more single shots, he picks his opponent, and he will circle them onto his right hand because that's his power. Now, if you watch here, he circles Travis Brown over so he can throw that big right hand over the top. That just, I mean, it just put Travis Brown on standby. It, you know, it, it, was a, it was a really nicely time punch. Uh, and, and watch Travis Brown's face. And I, I love Travis Brown, but this is a funny one where it spins his mouth guard around in his face. Hey! Ooh. Not nice at all. Just shows the, the power that he's got in yeah. that hand. And Mark Hunt, what with his head movement and his rolling, he can cause some problems for Bigfoot with that. But, you know, again, Alistair Overeem, a fantastic striker. You know, he, he went almost 15 minutes with, with Alistair Overeem and eventually landed the shots that he needed to to get the fight won uh, against, a, you know, a, another world-class K1 fighter. So it's not like he's not been in there with these guys. And the other thing that we've got to remember is that you know, he has a world-class black belt. He, yes. he's, he's a very good grappler. So if he can get the fight to the floor, and Mark Hunt's got fantastic takedown defense, but if he can get the fight to the floor, that's a whole new dynamic. And I'm yeah. sure he'll be watching that fight against Stipe Miocic that Mark Hunt had and taking some things from that. So 
I mean, although they had a fantastic fight in the, you know, in the first time, this one could potentially be a lot better. I think he moves very well for such a big guy. It's deceiving his speed. Yeah. And, you know, we saw there he was throwing up head kicks and a few other. It just doesn't yeah. seem to suit no. his and, body type. And you don't want to get hit with one of those feet. They're like this big. I <laughs> it's mean, like an elephant's leg. Yeah, it's like a canoe. His shoes are like canoes. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff, thanks Dan. Well, it's going to be a huge fight and we have some huge odds to go with it. Which of the heavy-handed heavyweights will get the knockout or will submissions be a factor? As ever, there are odds to be found on all the rounds and every outcome from Unibet, the official betting partner of the UFC. This isn't it for UFC 193. Make sure to check out our other show where we look at the main event, Rowdy Ronda Rousey versus boxing specialist Holly Holm. We will also be looking at the Australian fighters hoping to electrify the crowd. So thanks for watching and goodbye for now.